Well, thank you very much indeed for taking time out in what is a ridiculous schedule, frankly. It's good to be, it's good to be able to talk to you. <laughs> Why history? You've spent your life buried in very deep research, which shows in the quality of some 14 books now. You're in constant demand to speak. You plainly believe that history is incredibly important. Why? I suppose there was one semi-sunny afternoon when I was about 15. It's Scotland and I'm sitting in my rather small garden uh, at my parents' house, reading War and Peace by Tolstoy. There wasn't a lot on, on Scottish television in those days, and so uh, I was reading. And at the end of War and Peace, a novel I adore, uh, Tolstoy writes an essay about what it all means after all the disruption that has been inflicted on his characters by Napoleon's invasion of Russia, what exactly does it all add up to? And that historical essay captured my imagination, particularly when Tolstoy asks, what is the power that moves nations? And I remember thinking, well, that really is an interesting question. So I drifted at that point away from the study of literature and into the study of history. And ever since I've been asking the question, what is the power that moves nations? I'm unusual because I was taught as an undergraduate at Oxford that we couldn't learn anything from the past and that that was a sort of naive, rather jejeune thing to try to do. I think we can learn lessons from the past. I think that's the whole point of history. And so my interest in the past is, is an interest designed to influence our thinking about the present and the futures there's no such thing as the future singular, the futures that we have to contemplate. So for me, history is not just about the fascinating human past, it's about what we are going to do now and how we can learn from the past to avoid past mistakes and perhaps do better than previous generations. Jordan Peterson made the observation uh, when he was in Australia recently that we have a private memory. We burn our hand on the toaster when we were a kid and that becomes part of what we understand about the world. We don't do it again, we don't make the same mistake. We should understand we have a sort of a corporate history as well. Many political ideas in particular have been tried and if you look at them closely you'll get an idea as to whether they were a good idea or a bad idea but we tend not to remember them properly. I thought it was a useful observation. A good illustration of this is the way in which young people think about communism. Uh, I mean, we are in the midst, I, I suppose, of celebrating uh, Marx's, uh, what, bicentenary. Now, the effects of Marxism in practice were catastrophic. And every state that was run by professed Marxists suffered significant economic uh, and social dislocation if not downright disaster. The ballpark number for the victims of communism in a century, uh, in the 20th century, was roughly 100 million. Mm. How many universities in the Western world currently offer courses on the history of Marxism that show that? Mm. I would guess single digits. There is relatively little serious exploration of Marxism in practice. I was recently asked, you know, why, why are millennials uh, attracted to socialism? And the answer is really simple. They've never experienced it. They never had their hand on the toaster. Uh, 
they haven't been taught about it. If they have been taught about it, they've been taught about it by Marxists. There are very, very few courses that show the devastating consequences of the Russian Revolution for the Russian people. There are very, very few courses that assign Frank de Kurta's books on the Maoist regime in China. So it's, it's really quite simple. We can't learn everything through personal experience. No young person had the chance to go to the mm. Soviet Union. I'm old enough to have been to the Soviet Union when it still existed. They've got to be taught, and we don't do it. Yeah, well, you quote Churchill approvingly in one of your books. You say, uh, he, he made that famous remark, that the further you can see into the past, the further you'll be able to see into the future. Uh, there's a couple of things that arise out of what you've just said that I think are worth pursuing. Um, and, and as an, another observation, I, I suspect in Australia today, uh, it would be very much easier to march under a hammer and sickle flag than it would a Nazi flag. Uh, and yet you could argue really that the hammer and sickle and everything it represents visited more misery on human beings than fascism did in the 30s and 40s. I mean, keeping score isn't really mm. the way to think about this, but certainly if you were keeping score, uh, communism wins uh, in terms of the number of violent deaths inflicted. That's because it, it had longer, of course. Mm. Fascist regimes were pretty much annihilated by 1945. But there's a, another important point which comes when you study uh, totalitarianism, when you study different forms of totalitarianism. That the ideological differences are very profound uh, in the sense that the, the ideological foundation of Marxism-Leninism was a view of society derived from Marx's writings that divided us into classes and our identities were essentially based on class, whereas the ideology of fascism uh, was based on the race or, or, the, mm. or the nation, or the ethnic group. And I think we have an inclination to think that one is somehow worse than the other. Uh, but when you look at the practice of, say, Stalin's Soviet Union, that difference is much less obvious. Uh, for one thing, Stalin was perfectly prepared to regard class identity as hereditary. And if you were the son of uh, a bourgeois or of a nobleman, then you were suspect by definition. So class became a hereditary attribute. Secondly, Stalin's Soviet Union persecuted people on the basis of nationality and race too. I mean, Stalin had his own uh, pathological anti-Semitism in the later part of his life. So what seems like a clear distinction, and I've heard it made many times by academics on mm. the left, that somehow fascism is worse because Marxism is based on class and fascism is based on race. On serious historical inspection, uh, that distinction disappears, or at least it becomes much less meaningful. We don't want people to march under the swastika or the hammer and sickle. We don't want people in Hitler t-shirts. We don't want them in Marx or Lenin or Stalin t-shirts either. Mm. The most important thing to try to communicate to young people is that a free society is an incredibly precious thing. That the notion of individual freedom should be sacrosanct and that both Marxism, Leninism, and National Socialism repudiated the essential freedoms of the individual and on that basis committed hideous crimes. As I said, it's not just about the body count, uh, it's also about the motive. And the fundamental motive of totalitarian ideologies is to destroy individual liberty. Mm. So, why? It, it, it seems to me then that the newfound resurgence of great interest in those sort of left-wing solutions to how we might organise ourselves would not be so attractive if we understood our own history so well. It seems to me it's made a lot easier because we seem to loathe our own cultural underpinnings. We want to detach ourselves from them. In fact, you'd almost argue we're becoming a cut flower society. We're, we're removed from the plants uh, that we were grown on, and if you like, and uh, the soil in which we were nurtured. Why, why from a, given our history, have we come to be so disparaging about our own culture? Well, you mentioned Churchill a minute ago, and of course it was one of Churchill's cherished projects to write a history of the English-speaking peoples. Uh, it would probably get you uh, at least disinvited from most major campuses. Uh, 
it's become quite hard to write about the history of the British Empire without being subjected to, uh, to vilification. So there has been a pretty successful effort on the intellectual left to delegitimize the study of, of British and indeed European expansion. Now, for me, this has always seemed strange because it's clear that one of the most important historical phenomena of the half millennium after around 1500 was the emigration of Europeans and their settlement all over the world from North America uh, to Australasia. And that that's such an interesting phenomenon, we need to study it in all its complexity. And I've written a couple of books that deal with this issue, Empire and Civilization, books that take very seriously and document the bad things that mm. Europeans did when they, they settled in other countries, the, the effects that their settlement had, both unintended and intended, on native populations. That's something that's not in any way whitewashed uh, in my writing. But I also show that this process of expansion transformed the world in, in positive ways too. And a great deal of what we take for granted as the modern world today is a consequence of that period of European uh, settlement. And Australia uh, today is a very clear example of what happens when you transplant a civilization and you essentially establish it in a completely new setting. I don't think it would be possible to argue that this has been a, a net failure, a net disaster. There has been all kinds of ugliness along the way, but on balance, it seems to me clear that the benefits have outweighed the costs. Same goes for North America. Certainly, slavery remains a blot on the history of the United States of America. But that is not the only thing we should discuss when we're talking about the history of the most successful economy, and it could be argued the most successful democracy in history. The difficulty we have is that a subtle weighing of costs and benefits is not regarded as legitimate by people on the left who will simply demonize you for talking about those benefits and insist that we must only talk about uh, the costs. I was very struck by the fact that after the publication of Empire, which is now nearly 15 years ago, there really wasn't a reasoned debate in, in Britain. There was a sustained attack, often I thought by people who hadn't read the book, implying that the book was an apologia for imperialism, which is not. It's a historical attempt to understand the phenomenon in both its good and bad respects. I found it very depressing that we couldn't have a serious debate about the costs and benefits of empire, and it turns out we still can't. An article was published recently in a scholarly journal by a young North American academic, asking precisely this question, rather to my mortification, he didn't cite my work, but that's okay, but he was more or less flayed alive for having written this. So we've, we've essentially arrived at a situation uh, in which we can't discuss uh, this subject. And therefore, gradually it is accepted that it must all have been bad, and therefore we must all feel in some measure alienated from our roots, from Australia's roots, for that matter, from the roots of, of North America's societies. And, and that leads, I think, in turn, to this slightly exaggerated exaltation of other cultures and civilizations and uh, systematic denigration of anything that really could be associated with British or European expansion. It's a bizarre distortion of historical reality, but as an ideological achievement, you have to hand it to the left. They really have achieved their goal, which was to delegitimize uh, the consequences of European expansion and to make people descended from European settlers feel ashamed of their roots. Well, I, I think Marx observed that if people derived of an understanding of their heritage are easily persuaded. It's very clear that one way of winning the culture war is essentially to distort and skew the teaching of history. And I think people who lean to the right have been rather passive and perhaps naive in allowing this process to go so far uh, 
that in not only universities uh, but also in high schools, a version of the past is now taught that might as well have stamped on the back of it, you know, made at the Institute of Marxism-Leninism or made uh, at the Frankfurt School. The left has been very successful with its own imperialism, but what the left has done is to colonize universities and schools, colonize departments of education, establish colonies there, and then send out its missionaries uh, to teach young people a version of events that might make sense in the context of Marxism-Leninism, but is in fact a complete and grotesque misrepresentation of, of the past. And therefore likely to be very dangerous. Uh, I'd be interested in your comments uh, on the, this very strong push we see, certainly in Australia, for equality. Equality of opportunity, no one would argue with. Equality of outcome seems to me to sound superficially attractive, but to be in fact very dangerous. It seems to me, in many ways, that's what the Marxists were after. Uh, and that if you pursue uh, equality of outcome at all costs, you actually end up limiting freedom enormously. But you're better to focus on freedom and you'll get reasonable degrees of equality of opportunity at least. We know more and more from the people who work on, uh, on human genetics that ability is not equally allocated, talent, aptitude, whatever you want to call it. And therefore, there's very little likelihood of a truly equal society occurring spontaneously. Uh, left to our own devices, uh, we are normally distributed in a kind of bell curve. And out here in the tales of the distribution are people who will do very, very well and people who will do very, very poorly. So, we don't, I think, want a society in which those outcomes are completely unfiltered by policy, uh, particularly when you consider how quickly an unequal society develops an unequal education system, which makes it harder and harder for talented people in the bottom of the distribution to get out of there. So we have to recognize the need for some kind of policy, but policy should certainly aim at an equalizing opportunity, opportunity. To equalise outcomes is possible within a democratic system if people vote to have high marginal ra rates of direct taxation. And some societies do that. Scandinavian societies are well known for having extremely high uh, taxation rates and a rather large mm. amount of distribution through that channel. The French do this too. Fine. If a democratic choice is made, to tax chief executives extremely high, high, high rates of taxation and then redistribute to people who work for them, fine. Once you cross the line beyond a democratic decision-making process into one in which equal outcomes will be achieved through coercion, then you enter the realm of, of Marxism-Leninism. You're on the road at that point to North Korea or on the road to what uh, Friedrich Hayek called serfdom the new serfdom that essentially Marxism-Leninism offered. So I think the key is to confine ourselves to what is democratically uh, viable. If parties want to run on programs of radical redistribution, let them do that. Let them put their case to the voters and we'll see which countries want to be Finland uh, and which would prefer to have lower taxation key point here is it turns out that in many cases large-scale redistribution through fiscal policy has negative economic consequences, mm -hmm. slows the growth rate, leads to distortions. The bigger the state gets, the more room there is for corruption. There are lots of reasons why even democratically selected socialism doesn't work out so well. Believe me, I lived through the experiment that Britain ran in the 1970s with policies like that. Not so long ago, and yet young people prepared to vote for Corbyn. If you it's quite real, are, if you're a millennial, mm. if you know the the days of uh, of stagflation are as distant as as World War II is to me. It's it's very difficult to know what that was like, especially if nobody tells you. 
especially if you're going hand in hand to the IMF in the 1970s. Right. I mean, that I, isn't really so very long ago. No, it's not. But it's been forgotten. Forgotten altogether. And that allows a new generation to mm. fall for the old, apparently appealing uh, offers mm. of free education, mm. uh, cancel the student loans, handouts for all, mm. and tax the rich. I mean, that stuff will always play well provided people don't know the history know the of history. past experiments in that domain. So mm. I think here we, we should have won this argument uh, in the 1970s and 1980s, but it, it seems like you have to win it every generation mm. to be sure that the experiment doesn't get rerun. Mm. So Neil, what we're painting here is uh, the suggestion, I think, uh, that perhaps Malcolm Muggeridge had it right way back here in America in 1978, I think it was, in his Blaise Pascal lecture where he commented that the West is in danger of eating itself out from within. And you talk quite a bit about this. What is the great threat? Before we come to that question, let's just do a quick canvas of the, the sort of the bigger economic and immediate sort of external threats to, mm. uh, to the West because they, they are certainly mounting. There's a sense in which Camelot seems to have come to an end. There, there are challenges everywhere, major economics. And we had a debt crisis 10 years ago. We resulted with more debt. The debt's not gone away. You've said quite a bit about that yeah. lately. There's the question of open borders um, and the whole potential for Islamization and the challenges that might arise out of that for the West. The external challenges. Then there's the China, America, the tensions that are emerging there. Um, and you've written again about the, uh, the way in which the newcomer is sometimes, if you like, can become a little too sure. Or that person who feels threatened will perhaps over-respond. Dangers um, from the lessons of history again. A quick canvassing of, of, of the world as you see it at the moment so that we can consider this issue. Mm. What's the biggest challenge? Our loss of faith in our own beliefs and values and culture? Uh, uh, or, or is it external? Well, I'm not sure we're even allowed to talk about Western civilization anymore. Um, they used to have a course on, on Western civilization here at Stanford that, that was outlawed long ago. Uh, when President Trump gave a speech about Western civilization in Poland uh, last year, he was roundly denounced uh, in the liberal media. Uh, so it's become in itself a problematic concept. But let's accept that there still is something that connects, let's say, Western Europe, with North America, with Australasia. Let's, let's just mm. assume that Samuel Huntington wasn't completely raving when he wrote his book, The Clash of Civilizations. What are the threats to that civilization? I think there are three. I'll take them in ascending order of importance. Number one, radical Islam. Whether you look at the Sunni or Shia branches of Islam, mm. there's clearly an ideology, you might call it a politicized religion, that targets Western civilization, that is explicitly hostile to values of individual uh, freedom, equality of the sexes, the things that have come to be quite central to our civilization. And that threat manifests itself not just in terrorism, it includes the fact that there are regimes run on the basis of that ideology that may pose a strategic threat uh, to Western countries. The second threat, uh, which I think is, is a bigger threat, is the rise of China, still run by a one-party state, and crucially, economically, more successful than any previous rival to the West, much more successful than the Soviet Union, much more successful than Nazi Germany. Indeed, by some measures, China is already a larger economy than, mm. than the United States. And under Xi Jinping, overtly aiming to be at least an equal of the United States and pursuing policies, for example, the Belt and Road Initiative, that have at least the look of empire about them. Thirdly, and I think the most important challenge to Western civilization is the one you alluded to, the challenge from within. Our own self-hatred or at least self-doubt, our refusal to teach uh, serious history to our, our kids, our refusal to assign the Western canon in universities, I could go on. Now, if one looks at those three th threats, the threat from Islamic extremism is most serious from the vantage point of 
of Europe because there is a potential for ongoing large-scale migration from predominantly Muslim countries into Europe. And that could fundamentally alter European societies. The process is already mm. quite far advanced in some countries and in some cities in particular. The challenge for the rest of the West is, at this point, smaller, but it's imaginable that 10 or 20 years from now, there could be parts of the United States that resemble those parts of Europe that are most obviously affected today. The Chinese threat, I think, is only really problematic if we believe that a one-party state can continue to grow at around 6% per annum for mm. at least another 10 or 20 years. I'm not entirely convinced that it can. I think there's something deeply paradoxical about having such a centralized system run the affairs of a fifth of the human race. But that's the key issue there. Can they get to the point, not just of economic parity, but of military parity? Mm. Do they win the artificial intelligence race? If they do, then I think all bets are off, and then the West has a really major problem, a much more serious problem than the problem posed by Islamic State. But in the end, none of this really should trouble us too much, because at least on paper, our system is superior. Yeah. It's superior well, we in every conceivable in it. way. It offers far more mm. opportunity for human uh, self-fulfillment. It offers greater opportunities for gifted people uh, to innovate, to be original. Without free speech, how can you really have sustained intellectual advance? I mean, that's a fundamental question that I don't think the Islamists or the Chinese have a good answer to. But if we decide that we're the problem and that all the world's problems, you know, from the Middle East to the Far East, originate in the wickedness of the West, then there's a, there's a risk that we just hoist the white flag. And I see the white flag being hoisted on a fairly regular basis. Surrenders, concessions, capitulations, uh, on a whole range of issues, both cultural and economic. So the problem is really number three. It's our decision whether Western civilization goes down the tubes or not. It's, I think, historically well equal to withstanding these challenges. We withstood the huge challenges posed uh, by Nazism uh, and by Stalinism. We, we, we withstood the challenges of fascism and communism. We ought to be able to deal with uh, an attempt to revive uh, 7th and 8th century, uh, century Islam, and we ought to be able to deal with a hybrid system which is communist in name but capitalist in much of its practice. But if we decide to throw in the towel, then it's pretty clear what the future looks like. The data is always interesting around how people feel and what they think. Uh, the Lowy Institute in Australia has done some research which suggests a staggering number, a truly staggering number of young Australians are no longer convinced that democracy is necessarily the best form of governance. can only reflect a lack of understanding and poorly taught history or history not being adequately taught, I would have thought. It also shows that uh, young Australians are quite pessimistic about their future. They don't believe they'll have the opportunities and the, and the, and the life chances that their parents and grandparents had. So you couple that with the levels of anxiety, of depression, uh, and I'm afraid in our country of youth suicide, mm. and you wonder what, what's gone wrong when we have so much, we're so fortunate. It's not immediately obvious why people should be so pessimistic in the, in the millennial cohort. Uh, you can guess that finances have something to do with it, mm. and the prospects of uh, getting into real estate markets that are very expensive, don't look bright. Uh, there's a pretty steady mm. stream of warnings that jobs will be disrupted by artificial intelligence. Uh, so this generation mm. better hope for universal basic income. You can see why they're somewhat economically pessimistic. It goes against the trend of most of economic history that they should be worse off than their parents. Yes. That would be a very surprising mm. outcome. But I can see where this pessimism mm. comes from. I can also see why there is a questioning of the political status quo. The political status quo in Australia and here is democracy. Young people tend to question the status quo even when it's great, mm. uh, even when it's okay, and they tend to grow out of that. So don't expect people to have a full appreciation of the benefits of democracy at age 17. I'm not sure I did. Uh, but there's nothing like that moment when you pay your first tax bill uh, to educate you politically. So I wouldn't worry too much about this. Uh, 
the, the key question, it, it seems to me, is why is our, our political debate, particularly amongst young people, becoming so, so savage? Why is there so much intolerance? Why has the atmosphere become so toxic in politics? Uh, why so many ad hominem attacks? And there I think there is a clear answer. It has an awful lot to do with something that dominates the lives of young people, social media. I mean, the millennials are the first generation really to, to grow up, to come of age with smartphones, to come of age on online social networks, to consume more and more of their, their time via platforms like Facebook uh, and YouTube and the rest. And I think there's not just a psychological cost to this transformation of the public sphere, there's also a political cost. One of the things I try and show in my new book, The Square and the Tower, is that we have a problem. Our public sphere has been fundamentally changed by the internet. And the people most exposed to that change are young people who, it's clear from the data, spend enormously large amounts of their time online, on network platforms. These platforms were supposed to create a global community. We were all going to be happy netizens, merrily sharing cat videos. That was the kind of mm. vision that Silicon Valley sold. I try and argue in the book that that's at odds with both historical experience and network science. It was very predictable that large social networks online would tend to be polarized. There would indeed be a tendency for self-segregation to happen, for people to form into clusters, rather hostile clusters, ideologically and in other respects. And it was also predictable that crazy stuff would go viral more readily than true stuff. So it seems to me that part of what happened to us was that we drank a lot of Kool-Aid manufactured not far from here in Silicon Valley. Kool-Aid that essentially persuaded us that if everybody was connected and everybody was online all the time, everything would be awesome. That was the message. And it turns out that that was completely wrong. And we should be much more skeptical about the claims that were made by the big Silicon Valley companies. So that, I think, gets to the millennial problem better than almost anything else, because they're the ones who are on their phones all the time, you know, morning, noon and night. They're the ones who are obsessively seeing how their popularity is faring on Facebook and on, on other platforms. And we, we, I think, have happily handed our kids technology phones at very early ages, allowed them to get addicted to them. And now we're surprised that millennials look at the world differently from, from we do. I think future generations will say they handed their kids phones the way a couple generations before people handed their kids cigarettes. There's a bunch of very interesting things to unpack there. The first, though, is that as a historian, I think you um, clearly indicate that perhaps the the developers of all of that technology who said this is a brave new world, it'll make us all netizens and the world will be a better place, government will work better, the networks will be effective. You point to the fact that there is something to be learned from history, the printing press. The parallel that strikes me most is with the 16th and 17th century. Most people when they're trying to understand the world using any historical analogy fall back on the 1930s or maybe the 1970s, but it's always the 20th century. I think that's maybe hmm. because it's all that anybody's ever taught now. So it's either, to take the case of the United States, it's either the advent of fascism or it's Watergate. That, that's really the choice. And I came to realize, writing The Square and the Tower, that any analogy with the 20th century was unlikely to be helpful because the world's so fundamentally different, not least in terms of communications technology, today from the mid-20th century. In the mid-20th century, hierarchical structures could dominate media almost completely. If governments wanted to control radio, they could. The telephone network, they could tap it. Movies, they could monopolize it. It was perfectly straightforward for authoritarian regimes to control the media. It was actually pretty easy for democratic regimes in the 1950s to, to do it. We live in a completely different age, an age transformed by the internet, and the personal computer and the smartphone. The decentralization that occurred as a result of those technologies was really quite profound. The only comparable phenomenon, I think, in history is the effect of the printing press on Europe. After it was introduced in the later part of the 15th century, the public sphere was transformed. Prior to that, books had to be copied out by hand. 
It was very costly to transmit a message in any way in pre-printing press Europe. By the time you get to 500 years ago, when Martin Luther starts to make his critique of the Roman Catholic Church, you've got printing presses in nearly every town mm. in Northern Europe. And with amazing speed, his message can go viral. So I think we have a much more powerful analogy mm. looking at that time of the printing press than looking at the 20th century when we're trying to understand our own time. I would say, and there's some good academic work that I cite to support this, that the effect on the public sphere of the printing press is comparable with the effect on the public sphere of the internet and the personal computer, except that, of course, this is a larger scale yeah. and it's also faster, mm. roughly an order of magnitude faster. Mm. So what took about 200 years back then can have taken 20 years in our time. But the phenomena and indeed the pathologies are very similar. Stuff went viral in the 16th and 17th mm. century. Not necessarily good stuff. The theory that witches lived amongst us is a good example of this. Uh, an idea very appealing and very likely to c catch on in pr places that had embraced the Protestant Reformation, including my own country, Scotland, where a great many witches were burnt. Luther thought, if everybody could read the Bible in their own language, that the priesthood of all believers would be realized. Everybody would have a direct relationship with God, not necessarily mediated by a corrupt clergy, and everything would be awesome. I mean, he didn't quite put it like that, but you know what I mean. In the same way, as Mark Zuckerberg said, Facebook would create a global community, and everything would be awesome. And guess what? In the case of the 16th century, within a very short space of time, two hostile clusters formed not a global community, but a deeply polarized society. And for 130 years, Protestants and Catholics waged war on one another in Europe, uh, wars that claimed millions of lives. In our time, thus far, the wars are mostly verbal. They're online culture wars. But what worries me is the way in which verbal violence can start to pave the way to actual violence. I'm very troubled by the polarization that I see around me in the United States. I'm troubled by the, the viciousness of the language that gets used online, as well, of course, as the, the fake news that circulates. And I'm worried that we've created on the internet with giant network platforms like Facebook and YouTube, engines of polarization, engines of confirmation bias. Watch one video, say you like it, show engagement, yep. they'll send you another one. Yep like that one, but more extreme. That's mm. how YouTube works. Mm. They don't really care, it seems to me, that much about truth. They care about user engagement. That's their business model. So that's a very dangerous world. And history tells us it has the capacity to get more dangerous. Polariza polarization doesn't just stop. People don't just say, okay, that's mm. enough. We'll just hold it there. These tendencies tend to keep going until they produce some kind of real crisis. I think we had a warning. We've had a warning in 2016, but I don't think that warning has truly been heeded. The 16 being Trump and Brexit, of course, and, and right. the power of media. And what media. was revealed mm. in 2016, which yeah. was the annus horribilis mm. for the liberal internet, was mm. that the tools that had been created in Silicon Valley mm. could be used by malicious actors, yeah. as well as by mm. populists and conservatives they just didn't approve of, but they could mm. be used by the Russians, they could be used by the jihadists, they could be used in all kinds of ways to advance mm. messages deeply yeah. uncomfortable to the people. Uh, of Silicon Valley, mm. but that revelation hasn't really produced much change. Mm. If anything, the network platforms are more powerful now than they were two years ago. But I don't think that their mode of operation has in any mm. meaningful way changed, and I think the dangers that they exacerbate political polarization are very much present. The research shows very plainly that we've got a massive problem with polarization. You can see it in the numbers. The number of people in Australia, who are now and it would be the same right across much of the West, if not all of it. Identifying as left, self-identifying as left is increasing. The number of identifying as conservative is increasing. And the middle ground is being shrunk. And if you accept the premise that, and this is very important when you face all of the policy challenges that we now face right across the globe and in, 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 in our countries individually, that you have to have a good and reasoned and quality debate if you want good public policy this is very troubling. 
the bad news we know, mm. and particularly if it's loaded with emotive language, often misleadingly loaded, travels far faster than good news. It's quite staggering. Yeah. It really travels much faster and it's passed on much more quickly right. and much more consistently than good news or accurate news. There is a real problem with fake news. Um, and uh, we have so many people now plugged in to those platforms that the network, it seems, is in danger, to use your language, of running out of control yeah. and leaving the hierarchy, governments, in a position where they're not able to operate functionally. Well, some are. I mean, it works quite well in China. If you think about the way... Yeah, of the democracy. Right, but I mean, but, you think mm. about the options here. Mm. In the Chinese model, the network platforms, Alibaba, Tencent, mm. and so forth, are essentially subordinate to uh, the Communist Party. Data that the party may want are available on demand, and an entire system of surveillance far more sophisticated than the one uh, imagined by George Orwell in 1984 is being built. So that's one model. It's much less easy in the West because in the United States there's more or less open conflict between the government, Washington, and, and Silicon Valley. Think only of Mark Zuckerberg's uncomfortable mm. two days of being grilled by congressional committees. I think that Facebook, not to mention YouTube, not to mention Twitter, together pose a meaningful threat to the stability of democracy. We saw that in 2016. Uh, they pose a threat because they are available uh, to all advertisers, including Russian intelligence. Uh, they pose a threat because they are designed, the algorithms are designed to promote fake news and extreme views. Uh, they pose a threat, uh, I think, because they encourage the kind of polarization we've been talking about. A tweet is 20% more likely to be retweeted, mm. retweeted if it contains emotive language. Mm. The incentive Which, which is might, I might add is often what the left itself would accuse the right of using so often, hate language. Well, the hate language is actually much more prevalent on left-wing Twitter than on right-wing Twitter. That's, I, that's my I, point. I've, I've been very yeah. struck by how often the F word mm pops up on, on left-wing Twitter. But add these things together and you see that it becomes harder and harder to manage democratic debate because of these mm. different forces, because mm. there are participants in the debate who shouldn't mm. be there, who are not legitimate, including bots. Remember, yeah. a lot of what goes on on Twitter isn't human at yeah. all. It's, it's, it's actually uh, computer activity, bot activity. Uh, this, it seems to me, is a challenge as profound as anything that democracy has ever confronted. Mm -hmm. We have grown very accustomed to democracy coexisting with relatively centralized media, television, yes. for example, which is relatively easy to regulate. You, you can have mm -hmm. rules about political coverage on, on, on television. Uh, most countries have those rules to ensure that uh, there is a more or less level playing field for competing political parties. We've had more than a century of experience with newspapers. Mm. So we understand the traditional media and the role that they play in our democracy. And we have quite a sophisticated regulatory mm. framework in most, yep. in most countries. But this is a whole new ball game. And I think it's pretty clear that we are way behind the curve in how we, in how we manage this. The debate in the United States has got bogged down in the old argument about antitrust. Are these monopolies, should we break them up? It's a complete distraction. They're certainly making the owners very wealthy, which is one of the interesting lies to the modern push right. for equality, I would have thought. They're becoming very powerful and very wealthy, well, here's the, the owners as opposed to the users of the new platform. Yeah, the rule of the game, by the way, which George Soros discovered a long time ago, is you can be as rich a billionaire as, as you like, as long as you donate to left-wing causes, and then they'll leave you alone. And I think that's, that lesson has been well learned in, in Silicon Valley. But l let's come back to the core problem of how does democracy mm. operate when the public sphere has yeah. essentially moved from newspapers and mm. television into the internet. So that 80% of Americans now consume news via referral from either Facebook or Google. Those platforms are essentially curating the news for 8 out of 10 voters. 
So it's very different to opening up a newspaper and there are things there that might naturally interest you, but the things that don't as well, you get a menu, you get a variety, you get your meat and your vegetables. Well, the difference is that there saying, are multiple newspapers. I mean, yeah. in the news agents and uh, the, the, the mm. editor of the newspaper may rank the stories mm. by putting some on the front page and some on the inside pages. But, but here we think. have quasi-monopolies that mm. are essentially doing the ranking. And your search results on Google are an incredibly powerful uh, ranking uh, tool. That, that, that really determines what version of a story becomes dominant when something like eight out of 10 viewers are mm. seeing news stories through either Google search uh, mm. uh, engine or the Facebook news feed. So the power that that gives those companies is vast and I believe unprecedented in the history of of the media, unless you're talking about state-controlled yeah. television in the, uh, in, the, in the Soviet era. We don't know what to do about that. Breaking these companies up doesn't look like it's going to work. If in some ways they're natural monopolies. In other ways, antitrust in the American courts does not look like a promising road to go down. So what do you do? Do you regulate them like utilities? That argument was made by Steve Bannon as he was leaving the White House uh, last year. Uh, there is certainly an argument that they are, they are the railroads of public discourse, so maybe they should be regulated the way the railroads mm -hmm. used to be. I'm a little sceptical about that because then the power simply gets transferred from the network platforms to yet another federal agency. Uh, and I, I'm not convinced that that would necessarily produce a good outcome, quite apart from the the damage that would doubtless be done to innovation in, in the technology sphere. Remember also that regulation always helps the established incumbents, so the monopolies would almost certainly become more powerful under regulation. I think the only sane route to go down is to try to make these network platforms more accountable and more responsible for what they do. Because we're in a completely anomalous situation at the moment. Uh, the, the anomaly is that under mid-1990s legislation, network platforms, technology companies, are not responsible for the content that appears mm. on the platform. Yeah. They're classified as if they're not content publishers. Some people will be watching our interview via one of these platforms, and I could say all sorts of crazy stuff to you right now. Uh, then the question would be, uh, if Google allowed it to stay up on YouTube, um, are they liable? And the answer would be no. But Google would then say, we can't have hate speech on the platform. So we'll take this content down, or we'll at least indicate that there is a problem with it, or we'll just move it down the rankings so that anybody searching wouldn't find it. Here's where we are. The companies are increasingly getting into the censorship business partly because they're nervous of being accused uh, of uh, carrying hate speech. The more they do that, the worse, I think, for democracy. Well, look at the mindset of a lot of the people who will be making those decisions. Right. And how that works is a murky business indeed. Who devises the community standards? So there's a potential for these companies to become extraordinarily powerful as censors. And by the way, mm. the Europeans are encouraging them to do that by saying, if you don't censor hate speech, we'll fine you and fine you serious money. So there has to be some kind of middle position. Ideally, I think the regulatory framework should say, you are the public sphere and you cannot engage in censorship. Free speech is something that you must uphold. And with very, very few exceptions, paedophilia, terrorism, you should let content go up. Mm. Even if it's content you don't agree with, even if it's content that uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center says is offensive. You know, you, you mm. should, I think, mandate these uh, platforms to be true platforms. If they're platforms, they'll be like telephone networks. Telephone networks didn't interrupt to say, I'm sorry, you're using hate speech in your conversation. So I think we should say, you are f required by law to allow free speech, with very few exceptions. And then, Let's leave it to the law courts to decide, yeah. for example, if somebody is using the platform to make a slanderous or a defamatory accusation. So I think there's a road we can go down that will create a very light regulatory uh, framework, the main objective of which is to maintain free speech. But 
At the same time, we need to create some liability. I mean, there are content publishers. They're not just platforms. And they need to, I think, be regulated just in the same way that the television stations and the newspapers are regulated. Well, Neil, thank you. You've been very generous with your time. But let's finish on a positive. We ought to believe, I'm sure you'd agree, uh, and far better for me to put words in your mouth, but I think I can say this, that um, as believers in the liberal democratic tradition, there is no need for us as cultists to eat ourselves out from within, to surrender that greatest challenge of all, that we collapse ourselves. Surely we can believe that with goodwill, a commitment to evidence and data and reason in decision making rather than emotion and hate speech and polarisation as models, uh, we can do better. We have to be able to ensure that our young people believe in the heritage that we're passing on and that it can deliver for them, surely. I wrote a book called Civilization, which argued that the West did better than the rest for about 500 years because of, of six killer applications, six things that nobody else came up with. And those were competition, both political mm. and economic, the scientific revolution, the rule of law based on private property rights, modern medicine, uh, the consumer society, and the work ethic. Now, the rest of the world has downloaded quite a lot of those, though in the case of, say, China, not all of them. Certainly not political competition, certainly not the rule of law. There's one future in which they end up downloading the whole suite, and the world actually ends up westernising itself. Part of Western civilization, remember, is self-criticism. We've always been beating up on ourselves. This country is always telling itself it's in decline. It's one of its, its ticks. So one future is a future in which the killer apps are universally downloaded. Everybody has access to these ideas and institutions. And it actually becomes a Western world. China eventually goes that way, ends up with political competition, ends up with the rule of law. I think that's perfectly possible because I do think these ideas and institutions are so attractive. The other world is a world in which we decide to delete our killer apps. They decide not to bother with political competition. We decide that we don't need it either. And then we're screwed. The choice is actually quite straightforward. Mm. But one thing's for absolutely sure. You can't make that choice if you don't know history. If we educate a just generation that is historically deeply ignorant, then I think we're much more likely to be screwed than not. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. I hope what you've had to say is very widely heard.